Thanks for joining us on Space Nuts. Now, uh, Fred, because we've received so many questions in recent times, we're going to do a bit of catching up. But uh, this one came in via email uh, from Trevor in Victoria. Hi, Andrew and Fred. I have a question about light and if we can see it. Uh, light is said to be the fastest thing in the universe, travelling at about 300,000 kilometres per second. But given the size of our galaxy, let alone the size of the universe, this speed seems to be quite slow to me. Therefore, I was wondering if we were looking um, hundreds of light years out into space and let's say a new star suddenly uh, started to shine, would we be able to see its light travelling through space at right angles to us? I expect uh, it would need to be reflecting off dust clouds for us to see it, but from such a distance, it would seem to me that the light would appear to be travelling rather slowly across space. Uh, thanks, Trevor from Victoria, Australia. I, I think I understand what he's saying. So we're out in space and we're looking over there and a star ap appears. Could we watch the light traverse the universe at 300,000 kilometres per second, give or take? And yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, Trevor's given an absolutely picture perfect def definition of what we call light echoes because exactly that phenomenon happens. Uh, uh -huh. And so um, in a typical situation is a supernova explodes, uh, a star that uh, gets to the end of its life, it detonates, it has an enormous light output, becomes very bright for a relatively short period, uh, weeks or, or months in, in different circumstances. So what you've got is this um, expanding shell of light centered on the supernova, um, all traveling outwards in all directions at 300,000 kilometers per second. Uh, and and it's, it's well defined because it's got a sharp front edge where the supernova switched on and a relatively sharp back edge where the light has died down so that um, it's, it's fading. And so you get, yeah, this, this sort of wave-like bubble expands through space. And exactly as Trevor says, uh, if it hits something like a cloud of dust, then the dust cloud lights up. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not possible just to see the light itself from the side. It's got to be illuminating something. And it's only when it illuminates something like a dust cloud that you see it. The classic example was Superno Supernova 1987A, uh, which is in the Large Magellanic Cloud. It exploded in 1987. And about three years later, these two rings appeared around it, um, which turned out to be the front and back edges of a dust cloud that was actually in front of the supernova. Uh, so the lights, what we were seeing, we'd seen the, the direct light from the supernova, which had now faded away, but um, the light, what we didn't know that was that there were these dust clouds actually in front of the supernova. And when the light reached them, it, it actually lit them up. Uh, and so we saw that. And the reason why you see it later is because the light is now taking a dog leg path from the from the supernova. It's not going in a straight line. It's it's bouncing uh -huh. off something. And yeah. actually, um, it's it, it's a, a technique that I think is totally magical. Um, in fact, I've got a whole chapter on it in uh, Cosmic Chronicles. There's two plugs for books. Uh, <laughs> You're doing well today, Fred. <laughs> I'll get another one in in a minute. That's right. <laughs> um, the, 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 so yeah. So um, the. Uh, uh, one thing that I think is fabulous is that you can, if the dust clouds are far enough away, then you get a significant time delay in the, you know, the length of time between seeing the direct pulse of light from the supernova and the light echo. And the classic one is Tycho Brahe's supernova of 1572, mm. uh, which was observed again uh, by its light echo a few years ago. Uh, so we saw the same light, but reflected off a dust cloud. And that was fantastic because it meant that you could bring to bear all the modern instruments, the analytical instruments uh, that um, that actually uh, allow us to understand what's going on in a supernova. You could bring that to bear on the light that was, that was reflected. Uh, and I'm going to correct myself because it wasn't Tycho Brahe's supernova of 1572, it was Kepler's supernova of 1604. Uh, oh, it was right. a different one, but it's still, you know, 500 years ago, 400 years ago. I was going to pick you up on yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sure you were, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs>
What uh, yeah, and and uh, Trevor's uh, assertion that uh, the speed of light seems quite slow. Well, what do you make of that? Well, yeah, compared with the size of the universe, it is. Uh, mm. You know, we so the light from uh, the Big Bang itself, which we can still see, that's taken thirteen point eight billion years to get here, even though it's whizzing through space. But I tell you, three hundred thousand kilometers per second is pretty damn fast by yeah. any standards within the solar system. Um, uh, I, not, not as fast as teenage drivers can well, be sometimes. Well, there's that too. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, n notwithstanding that, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty high speed. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Um, the other thing about light that intrigues me is um, we, we can't see it. We can only see what it does. Is that a fair assumption? I mean, you, it's like uh, colour is an illusion, really. Yeah, and uh, well, color, colors uh, in the sense that you know you might see red differently from what I see it, but mm. to a physicist, red is very specific. It's um, light with a specific wavelength, uh, or carrying a specific energy, if you want to put it that way. It's the two are equivalent. So um, y yes, uh, it's only possible to see photons of light when they hit something. Yeah, uh, when they interact with a different kind of subatomic particle. That's what it actually means in physics terms. Mm. And, and the, the other thing that intrigues me is shadows. I mean, you, 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 uh, the photons hit something, so they, they don't go through it, and therefore a shadow is cast where the light doesn't go. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, we, we, we see it every day. We're so used to it. It's a natural part of being, but yeah. I still sometimes look at them and go, it's just, that's just weird. That's well, just weird. It, it, that's right. It is in in many ways. I mean, it's. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about shadows in a minute as well. But but you know, <laughs> you only see a shadow if there's light around that's not hitting the object that's causing the shadow. Yeah. So yeah, it, that's yeah, right. it's a kind of double negative thing. There. And the, the other thing is, of course, um, we see the light hitting the ground and the shadow from the object that's hitting that's behind us or something. But you've got to consider it on a, on a global scale that there's also a shadow being cast beyond the Earth because that light is being blocked by a planet. I mean, it's just, yeah, it's freaky. It's really freaky. Yeah. Indeed. Does my mind in. Um, thank you, Trevor. That's a really good question and, and self-answered if you didn't figure that out. <laughs> uh, now, let's, let's move on to, um, oh, this is going to be fun. This comes from Oregon. Hey, this is Nate from Oregon. Um, so a friend of mine at work and I were laughing about flat earth theories and uh, just in general having a good laugh about it. Um, I wanted to know what your guys' take on that is at a scientific level, because we all know it's obviously nonsense. And more importantly, being from Australia, what's it like walking upside down all the time? Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, Nate. Well, I, I'll tell you, I do get a bit dizzy occasionally and my nose runs backwards. <laughs> that's, that's, too much, that's too much information, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, flat Earth theory. Uh, we have actually addressed this a few times. Um, there are a few Flat Earthers that uh, have um, got into arguments with our listeners and uh, and. and, and People have come to us and said, look, how do we know? How do we know for sure that it's not flat? Uh, well, I think it was the Egyptians that initially figured it out, wasn't it, Fred? The, the, the Greeks certainly did. Um, the Greeks? Yeah. yeah. And, Maybe it was the Greeks. Um, and they used shadows to do that. And it's exactly the shadow that you've just been talking about, the one that right. the Earth casts in space. Uh, the Earth casts a shadow. We don't normally see it until, mm. as we were saying, the, the light hits something and the shadow and the light that you... Uh, you know, the, 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 the absence of light reveals the Earth's shadow. And that happens in, a, in an eclipse of the moon. And the bottom line is uh, ancient people observed eclipses of the moon. They figured out what was going on because they knew the sun was <coughs> on the other the side of, of the sky. And what they observed was that the, the shadow of the Earth is always a circle. Mm. And the only thing that would always produce a circle is a sphere. Uh, yeah. So... Um, that's how they knew it was spherical. And <clears throat> going to the question about what do we think scientifically of flat earthers, <clears throat> excuse me, they are really interesting scientifically, but it's more from the psychological point of view than anything to do with physics, because it is, uh, it is uh, unmistakably the case that the Earth is not flat, uh, that it's a, a, spher a spheroidal object, 
Um, and, you know, it's demonstrated in almost every possible way. Uh, and to deny that is um, denying something that uh, is a reality that everybody accepts. So it, it, it speaks of some really interesting psychological issues. And there was a, mm. uh, certainly an ABC science reporter recently went to a Flat Earth conference and he wrote up, he basically wrote it up um, as, a, as an, an interest in social behaviour and, uh, sorry, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 um, an observation of social behaviour, the way people who have got a crazy idea but uh, somebody else agrees with them, uh, they, you know, they've got this herd mentality and uh, you've got suddenly some really interesting psychology taking place, which could be quite dangerous in the wrong circumstances. Yeah, they, they share the same apartment as the anti-vaxxers, I believe. Maybe, but um, so. uh, I, I, you can understand the peoples of the past, the people of, you know, who historically believed the earth was flat, because you'd go down to the beach and you'd look out over the horizon and there was a line. Yeah. And you'd think, oh, well, that's the end of the earth. Yeah. That's, I mean, what else could you think? Yeah, that's right. So, so, and you're right. Probably most people, um, most people in ancient times thought the Earth was flat, um, but it was the the what you might call the cognoscenti, the intellectuals of the time, who knew that it wasn't. Uh, some early, there was an earlier, uh, you know, one one in some ways even earlier example of people trying to figure out what shape the earth was, was the fact that if you go a long way south, for example, you see different stars. Um, mm. And so that tells you at least that the earth is cylindrical. Uh, um, but then, you know, the eclipses tell you that it's actually a sphere. And, and as we discussed once in an episode far, far back, uh, if the earth was flat, there would be times where the shadow of the earth on the moon would be a line. Yeah, that's right. And that never happens. Never happens, no. Never. So there you have it, um, Nate, uh, all sorted. Uh, and thanks for the question. That was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm well, well, uh, not having... Sorry, I'm go I'm just going to say, you know, uh, the, the your nose running backwards uh, because we're upside down. Um, it, for me, um, the Earth's the right way up here in Australia. Yeah, that's what I reckon. But um, it is really interesting because so much of what we do in the world of astronomy uh, is... Uh, northern hemisphere biased um like you look at a chart showing the phases of the moon uh and even here in the southern hemisphere they show them the way around that they appear in the northern hemisphere so um first quarter shows the illuminated bit of the moon on the right whereas here uh, in australia it's on the left uh, yeah. so you know things of that sort well, that, that's the thing. I uh, I took a photo of the moon the other yeah, day, which lovely. I put on which I yeah. put online, and uh, it was actually a daytime photo. That's what I loved about it. I just sort of looked up and went, "Whoa, I'm going to take a photo of that with my little little um, digital camera." Came out beautifully. So it's on our um, Facebook page uh, on the podcast group Facebook page. If you want to have a look at it, a few people have actually stolen it for their um, for their uh, computer screens and and for their um, mobile phone screens, which I'm fine with. Yeah, you go for it. But, um, yeah, I, I looked at that photo, and then that night I was watching a TV show, and they showed a, a photo, a, a, like a, a screenshot of the moon from the northern hemisphere, and it was exactly the same um, uh, phase. Uh, ph phase of the moon yeah. that I had taken a photo of, except it was flipped. <laughs> it's upside down. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, we're the right way up. Yep. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks again for your question, uh, Nate. Lovely to hear from you uh, in Oregon. This is Space Nuts, Andrew Dunkley with Fred Watson. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.